Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola. And I'm Jonathan Rosales. And this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only and you want to see my sexy husband's face, go to my YouTube channel, <laughs> Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe, join in on the conversation. Guys, we have so much planned for this episode today. The obvious one, the reason you clicked it is we are going to be talking about our wedding and how it was completely different or would have been completely different than if I were to get married as a Mormon, uh, an active Mormon, actually, in the Mormon temple. We're going to go over all the differences and talk about how awesome our wedding was. And at the very end of the episode, we are going to discuss some major channel news. So a lot to talk about. The first thing is we are in our new studio, which you probably can see from the background here. I wanted to point out this gorgeous dream catcher behind me. This is from Spirit of Otter Tail. It's my mother's company where she makes Native American arts because we are part Cherokee. So if you want a custom dream catcher, reach out to her at Spirit of Otter Tail on Instagram. The other thing is we are sharing a studio with Method Box, which is Jonathan and Nathan's channel on YouTube. And we're going to get more into that later. But without further ado. Are you coming over here? I'm coming over there. Show them. <laughs> this is what we're doing with this little space. We have two different sets. This is going to be the Method Box set. But also, I think when we have guests on this channel, this is probably that are in person. This is probably where we're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Oscar. Let me officially introduce yeah. you to Oscar Meyer Wiener. He is our channel mascot. And if you don't see him ruffling up the pillows behind me in the episode, that's probably because he's on my lap and you just have no idea. It's actually a thing where Oscar will hop on Shalise's lap at the beginning of every episode. Yeah, and... it's like he can tell I'm about to start recording and I don't know if it's a switch in energy or something, but he'll be peacefully sleeping on the bed next to me. And then when I say to the guest, all right, you ready to go? He will jump up and walk over and sit on my, <laughs> sit on my lap. He's so sweet and we love him. Okay, so why we're here to talk about weddings, specifically what a Mormon wedding would have looked like versus what our wedding ended up looking like, because you could have had a completely different world life wedding, but yeah. instead we did a whole different thing. We're going to insert a bunch of footage from our own actual wedding throughout this video. So if you are listening to audio only, maybe jump on YouTube, probably gonna put photos up, from that our photographer sent over and some some video footage that our video team sent over to of our not so Mormon wedding. Yeah, so we definitely have to preface this by talking about Mormonism in general and kind of the mindset behind getting married. So the first thing everyone is probably thinking polygamy, that is something that Mormons practiced in the very early days of the beginning of the church and the early founders practiced it, multiple wives, but eventually they had to stop that. And if you want to learn more about the fundamentalist Mormonism, you can click here and we will lead you to an episode where we go into that in depth. You've gotten really good at that. The click here the thing. Click here. You're doing all <laughs> of YouTube babe. best practices. Thanks, and babe. I couldn't be more proud. Aww. So when it comes to getting married, the Mormon way is generally speaking, they want you to get married young so that you can have as many children as possible. It's not completely shoved down your throat. It's not in every single Sunday school lesson, but is a very strong undertone. So by the time you are eight years old, 10, 11, 12, they really start heavily focusing on you need to prepare to be a mother, a wife. Uh, they say that the more children that you have, the better because you're building up the kingdom of God, the one true religion, multiply and replenish the earth and continue the legacy of the right way, the Mormon way. Because women serve their man and the yeah. man serves the God. Yeah. And the yeah. more righteous, the hotter the wife, yeah, the that's more what, wives that's you what have they say. as far as the fundamentalists go. I've learned way more about cults than I ever thought I would have. We're going to get into all that. But <laughs> so from a young age, you were already on this mission of weddings, yeah. marriage, kids. And not just specifically weddings, but this is the whole reason we wanted to do this episode is because it's temple weddings. And there's a very high emphasis on getting married in the Mormon temple. You've all seen them. They look like castles. They're stunning and cost a lot of money. I remember learning from, geez, I was probably 
11. I was probably 12 when you first get into young women's because it was an all girls class. I remember them saying, your goal, ladies, is to get married in the temple. And even then, I remember thinking, I don't really want to. Like, I'm, I'm sure it's beautiful in there, but as someone who's super creative and wild and likes weird things, as you'll see from our wedding, I wanted something bigger and more interesting. I wanted to control where I got married. Also, you have no idea what the inside of a temple looks like until you get there. So you don't even know what you're signing up for. I feel like there's a part of your personality that was probably there from the time you were a kid that is very extravagant, that, yeah. that wants big things. You're a star. <laughs> yeah. So you've had that part of your personality pretty early on. Yeah. So were you combating this whole restrictive what this is what your wedding is going to be? This is what the box you're going to fit in yeah. with your actual vision of who you were as a person and what you wanted out of life? Oh, yeah. Immediately I was thinking to myself, well, I won't get married in the temple, but I'll get sealed in the temple. And that's when you can have a regular civil wedding outside somewhere, wherever you want. And then later, usually you have to go a year later uh, I think they may have changed it now recently, but you would have to wait and then you could get sealed with your partner. So essentially, you get the same blessings as far as getting married in the temple and getting sealed. Salvationally speaking, is the same. You get the same bonuses in heaven as far as making it to the higher levels. But and so I remember asking that in that in that lesson, I said, so what if I just want to get married somewhere else and then get sealed? And they said, you know what, Shalise? It's a great question. And let me just say, as someone who personally didn't get married in the temple, I highly regret it. And I wish that I have done it. I would have done it right the first time. They use the word right. And so they're guilting you into doing it the quote right way. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because you go to the celestial kingdom. Right. But it's it's even more than that. It's relevant because in order to get to the temple, you have to be, quote, worthy. OK, so you have to follow all of these different rules. You absolutely cannot have premarital sex, even if you're engaged and even just not even sex, like any of the small things, too. You can't do any of it. So you also aren't allowed to find out if you're sexually compatible with your partner before you get married. And that's also why a lot of Mormons get married super young because they're horny and they want to have sex, which I get it. But another the biggest thing that I wanted to mention is you have to be a full tithe payer. So for them to hold this thing over your head where, no, this is the right way, you have to give them money. You have to essentially pay. So it's very coercive in that way. It's not just a place you go to get married. There's a lot of things that have to happen in order for you to be worthy to get married in the temple. In fact, there's many stories. This is a Russian, a Russian roulette, a bishop roulette thing where let's say a couple has been engaged for a year and they quote slip up. Some bishops will cancel the wedding and say you are not worthy to get married in the temple. And then they have to tell all their friends and family, sorry, the wedding's off or postponed for an entire year. That's happened before because usually the penance for sexual sin is a year without going to the temple. So sometimes they have to do that. Other times you get a bishop who says, you know what, guys, it's fine. Don't do it again. You're getting married next week. Like, just leave it. But you never know what you're going to get. What a Mormon temple wedding looks like. Yeah. Did Joseph Smith look in a, in a hat and, and he just also <laughs> wrote all so, that down? So Joseph Smith looking in a hat usually refers to him translating the golden plates. But the stuff about marriage, especially polygamy, and I want to say temple marriage. You now people correct me in the comments if temple marriage specifically is not in the Doctrine and Covenants, covenants but I believe it is. That was direct revelation from God. So that he's com- not looking at the later. hats for that. That comes later. Yeah. Oh, I just had some visions. So that's when he's trying to convince Emma that polygamy is mm. something that he has to do. Emma, if you don't let if you don't let me practice polygamy, an angel with a drawn fiery sword is going to smite me and you, which is it's actually written in the Doctrine and Covenants. He did introduce temple ceilings back when he was doing his thing, his shenanigans, because in fact, when he was caught with Fanny Alger in the barn and Fanny was his live in maid, like young girl helping out with the kids. Emma walks in, sees them doing the dirty, and he's like, oh, no, 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 it's fine because she's actually a spiritual wife of mine. And Joseph Smith. And that's when he had already been practicing polygamy 
before that, years before that, behind her back, that was the first time that he was like, no, it's a revelation. <laughs> so, there was a point where, where Emma was fed up with him, right? She had it with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, like once she found out that he had been sleeping with other women behind her back and claiming it's because of God. I mean, Emma, this is a total tangent. So I'll just say quickly that when Joseph Smith died and her son was not made the prophet, she was like, yeah, I'm out. This church is not what it should be. And she created her own church, which is actually super progressive today. Mm-hmm. So tangent. But yeah, the funny thing about the temple stuff is it's almost directly plagiarized from many Masonic rituals, which a lot of people don't know because the Freemasons are also extremely secretive, a secret society that you have to be in the cool kids club to know. But a lot of the secret handshakes and even the verbiage, so I'm told, is very similar to Masonry. So that actually leads perfectly into what a temple marriage would actually look like. So (laughs) I've been in one of these rooms because, and I mentioned in a previous episode, I was sealed, my family was sealed to my sister. My sister, uh, half sister was sealed to us because you could do that. It's kind of like celestial adoption. (laughs) where Okay. Because if you're not sealed to your family, they tell you you're not going to be together in heaven. This applies to husband and wife, which is why they put so much importance on You have to get sealed in the temple or when you die, it is till death do us part. So they say, don't you want to be with your partner for time and all eternity? And some people are like, I don't know, do I? (laughs) But that's what you're supposed to do, because if you don't do that, your kids can't get sealed to you and then you're not going to see them in heaven either. So it's all of this fear that makes you think. I even remember asking my brother this. I remember saying um, and I won't get into his story because that's his story, but. I remember asking him, don't you want to get married in the temple? He's like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, but just in case, like, don't you want to do it just in case it's real? Because what if? It's a religion based off of sexual repression, Mm -hmm. sexual shaming and fear. And fear. Yeah, a lot of fear. So going into a temple marriage, so what I was trying to say is I've been in the room where you get sealed and where people would get married. And it's not that great. Pretty basic. Uh, There is an altar in the middle. And also, please correct me if this room is different than the one you get married in, but I'm pretty sure the ceiling room is the same as the the temple marriage room. There is a podium in the middle. It's like, I don't know, yay big, uh, two feet by four feet, maybe kind of set there. You go up and you kneel on it. And then whoever is working the temple that day, I don't know if you can choose who marries you. Maybe you can. But there's a script and they don't really get to go off script very much. As far as I'm aware, it's pretty cut and dry. This is what the Lord wants you to say. So the other thing about this is that it's very intimate. Not many people are there to witness this. Yeah, that's a really good point to make. It's a very small room. It's not this big, beautiful auditorium with chandeliers. And I don't think the room that we were in had windows. It was very dark and kind of gloomy and a little creepy in there. And you go in and everyone's in their temple clothes. So I'll put a picture on screen here, but you got the men in bakers hats, the women with veils, people who are not the bride in veils. You have this long white temple dress that are usually very ill-fitted and kind of ugly and uh, a green apron with leaves to signify Adam and Eve. So when I first walked in there, I was like, what is going on? Because I was eight or nine, I think, when this happened. And it was considered a privilege for me to even be able to go in there and witness this because normally I have to wait till you get married to see all this. So I just remember thinking, what religion am I in? This is super odd. And even one of my aunts, I think it was an aunt, came up to me after and she was like, so what did you think of the the temple clothes? Knowing like she's going to think it's weird because it is weird. But once you get to that point, you're just forced to go along with it because your entire life you're supposed to be preparing for this moment. So once you get there, you're not allowed to be like, oh, wait, this is what I've been preparing for. So something like that. The This is what the garments are Gar- going to look like. The garments. So you know what garments look like because you see your parents in garments. Got it. So is that the what's the proper term for what you're wearing? Tumble clothes. Tumble clothes. Who came up with this is how this looks? Was Probably it- Joseph Smith. I would actually really love to look into the history of the tumble clothes themselves. They seem like they have not changed since 1837 or whenever he introduced it. Basically, when I'm learning about the temple ceremony and I see 
how it actually went down. I just remember in my 20s because I left essentially because I wanted to get married. We'll get into that in a second. But when I see what I missed, I'm so glad that that was not my wedding. Now, I want to preface this and I should have said this earlier and I meant to. We are not saying that temple marriage is wrong, less than, bad, whatever adjective you want to fill in the blank here. We are just simply saying it is very different. And some people may have had a beautiful temple marriage experience. I've heard a lot of people who did not have a good experience because it's not anything what they were expecting. They left crying, feeling confused. So what we're here to show is how completely different it would have been if I would have gone down that path and just illustrate to people who aren't familiar with Mormonism the differences and what that would look like. Okay. The difference between the temple clothes and a wedding dress. Yes, drastically different. This is also something that I would love people to comment on if they know, but I'm pretty sure that the wedding dresses that they have you wear in the temple are pretty much the same thing as someone's everyday clothes. The photos that I've seen, I maybe there's a little bit more lace or something, but generally speaking, there's a very high neck, long sleeves to the wrists, to the floor, and very plain. Not much detail. Like I said, maybe there's some lace detailing, but it's not going to be see-through lace. It's just going to be overlay. What I've heard happening with other people is they get to the temple with their big, beautiful, fitted, extravagant wedding dress. And then they look at them and they go, oh, you can't wear that for the ceremony. And they have no idea. Sometimes they're not prepared for that. So then they just get shoved into whatever dress they have on the rack, because if you don't own your own temple clothes, you have to rent them. You don't even get them for free. (laughs) I'm pretty sure you have to pay to borrow a temple dress. You can wear clothes that someone else has worn in this super coveted process ceremony. Uh So there's nothing special about the temple clothes itself. Because they're, like I said, they're very very ill-fitted. The fabric is thick polyester, not comfortable. They're just not cute. I mean, I was put in one when I was a kid. Can I ask you something before we continue with the dress? Yeah. So this is the ceremony. Is there a reception that happens, like a celebration? Yeah. That's after. This is That's where, after. where you meet. Okay. Yeah. But, but that part doesn't have to be as restrictive with the people no, no, that no. come. So the reason that most women don't understand that they can't have their own wedding dress is because they've probably attended other weddings where what you do is the people who aren't invited to go in and watch the ceremony, like Jonathan, you were saying, there's very limited space. And let's say we were to get married in the temple pretend we were upstanding Mormons, Lord help me, and my parents are not Mormon anymore. They would not be able to attend my wedding, our wedding, because they don't have an active temple recommend. And again, in order to get that, you have to be following all these rules, uh, no drinking, uh, no sex before marriage, it wouldn't apply to my parents. Um, You have to be a full tithe payer. There's an entire interview that the bishop asks reads verbatim these questions no masturbating and that's that applies even if you are what, married like the weeks leading up to the wedding they would probably try and get their temple recommend long before to make sure there were no issues because this is also something that they scan now so if you go to the temple with a recommend you can't just be like look it's my recommend and they're like all right come on in they actually scan and they can see if it's active or not So that's something that my parents would have had to get months before, probably, to make sure that they could actually attend. So you have family members who cannot go to the ceremony. They have to wait outside. And I also want to clarify that I know there have been some rules around this that have changed a little bit. And I'm going to be honest in saying I don't 100% know all of those rules. And I'm sure people will let me know in the comments. I think they've been a little bit more lax about the temple ceremonies because of this exclusion of family members. So back to your question about the the dress thing and the reception thing. I remember going to two of my best friend's weddings. They were married super young. Uh, first one, 19. I don't know about the other one, uh, maybe 20, 21. But I had to stand outside because I wasn't worthy enough and I was same age. And it was for stupid stuff, which we can go over later. But 
I felt ashamed. People are looking at me like, oh, she's the best friend. She lives in Vegas. She's clearly not worthy enough to be in there and support her best friend, like some friend. I felt really bad about that, but I wanted to be there to support her because I could have just not gone to the temple and then people wouldn't have known if I was worthy or not to go in. But you wait at the doors, they come out in the dress that they purchased that are not the temple clothes. So we never get to see what they actually got married in because there's no photos. But so they come out in the wedding, their wedding clothes, okay. like a regular tux, a regular wedding dress that is modest now because once you go to the temple, you are given the garments. And that's what people refer to as magic underwear, not Mormons, but other people, where it's the, the t-shirt, basically t-shirt and shorts that you wear has to be the closest thing to your body. We talked about this in my mom's episode. Click here if you want to watch that. <laughs> there we go. Afterwards, they go to another location off Temple property, and that can be a location of their choosing. So uh, I guess what and I'm curious about is how creative, how expressive can the reception be? Right, right, right. I will give credit where credit is due. After they leave the temple, they can do whatever they want. Okay. It can be as big, as fancy, as small. Usually what happens is it's held in the church, which tends to not be very crazy. Like maybe they string up some fabrics. So you can't tell that you're in a gymnasium because usually it's just in the like on the basketball and, court. And usually the people, the, the guests help contribute to paying for the wedding, right? In that way. I don't know if they help pay for it, but from what I have observed, and this is also biased because I grew up in Utah, which is its own beast of a thing. but from what I've observed within Mormon weddings is if it is held at a church building, usually you have people helping with the catering, like someone brings a dish and it's kind of it's very homey. Mm -hmm. It's very community. You literally just use the chairs that are already at the church building and the tables that already exist there. You put a tablecloth, a little centerpiece, and it's very cost effective because you don't have to pay for the church building and you don't have to pay for the temple. So you're really just paying for decorations and a wedding gotcha. dress yeah gotcha. so you can be creative and expressive in the reception part you can it's just not as typical so the the brides that purchase the the fun dress that is a representation of them they can wear it put that on after they can put that on after okay. but with the restrictions of it has to be it has to cover your new garments and then the reception no alcohol right that is a major difference. So party, end, party ends weddings. at 9 p.m., right? <laughs> I will say Mormons love dancing and yeah. they tend to be really fun dance parties because if you've never had alcohol, you don't know what you're missing. Everyone just has a good time. Sure. Uh, but yes, usually dry weddings because even having alcohol would be seen as who do you know that's not Mormon or that's a Jack Mormon, which means you're Mormon, but you don't really follow the rules. Gotcha. So. I think it would be looked down on to have alcohol at the wedding, even if it's for people who are not Mormon. Is cursing allowed? It's not technically a rule, but pretty much. So you didn't grow up in a household that had the occasional swear word? No. So is that why you don't really swear? Probably. Okay. I remember the first time I said shut up and I felt bad. <laughs> shut the front door. You say that a lot. I said shut the front door. It's fun. But you know what? I don't think my parents ever cursed, at least not in front of me. They probably did. I just didn't hear it. And my brother's... They, I mean, they probably did, but I just, I was too, uh, I was too good. Okay. Sans the no alcohol, sans the no cursing. So you can't have, you got to play clean versions of songs for the oh, dance party. Big, big thing. Yes, absolutely. And then the super restrictive kind of sterile ceremony. It's, you could still have kind of a fun wedding. You can. And that actually jogs something in my memory as well about the dancing. Don't even try to twerk on the dance floor. Like you will be glared leave at. Leave room for Joseph Smith? Oh no, you leave room for a Book of Mormon. <laughs> they literally <laughs> would tell us that at dances. Don't get close enough to where you don't have room for a Book of Mormon in between you. And you know, we would always laugh like- Wait, wait, that... wait, wait. Oh, you're not being ironic. No. <laughs> they would say, leave room for a Book of Mormon in between ah, you. So you, oh, wow. no skin to skin, no okay. touching, That's no fair. chest to chest. I can't imagine the what it feels like to be that sexually repressed, especially at that age. Oh, I can. Where you're probably like the <laughs> horniest you're ever going to be because you're like 19, 20 years old, yeah. right? At the time, yeah. all the, the hormones going on. 
So that's why all the guys are like, gotta get married as soon as possible. You know what? That brings up a couple points. The first one is it's super common for couples between the temple and the reception to go bang it out. Yeah. Oh, like right after? Like, yeah, we're going to head out. No, no. Before they even get to the reception. Oh. They go home, bang it out, put their clothes back on. So like 30 on. seconds later. So then they come to the reception with big old smiles on their faces yeah. and everyone's like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, like because 10 pounds lighter. They have been waiting for sometimes years to get Jeez. married. I'm sure there's probably couples where it's like the sexual dynamic wasn't. I mean, you also don't know. You're not good at sex. So. Yeah, I wonder if people fear virgins. like, oh, well, you don't know, you don't know. So you they're know, just yeah. like, that sucks. That was actually my motto. So I remember being in Vegas and working in uh, on the strip, basically at Hard Rock. People would say, you're a virgin because I was 19, 20. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a virgin, like super proud of it. And then they're like, don't you want to know if you have sexual chemistry with the person yeah. you're marrying? Yeah. I was like, no, because. I don't know what I don't know. That was literally a positive thing to me because I thought ignorance. If I ignorance, ignorance is, bliss. is bliss, baby. Ignorance is bliss. Linda, listen. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> is it too early for the Linda no, listen? No, never. <laughs> never. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap that back around later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, having sex between the temple and the reception is very common. Another common thing that mm. I wanted to maybe not common. That's probably a bad word, but something that is known to happen because Utah is so close to Vegas. There have been people who will drive to Vegas, get married, have sex all weekend, and then get it annulled and go back to Utah because get, they're get, not breaking the rules. Get what annulled? Married. The marriage? Yes. That they just had? Yes. Wait, just so that they can have sex? Yes. So that's like, that's right there with the poop hole, <laughs> loop hole, and the yeah, soaking. I see the fog go over Jonathan's <laughs> eyes as he's like, I'm confused. <laughs> like tax evasion. Like, how do we just get around everything? Yeah, no, really, okay. that's a thing because it's a way to get around it. You can't have sex till you're married, but if you're married, fair game. That definitely sounds like something an earthquaker would do. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering what that is, click here. <laughs> Okay, oh so all right, but the point is, it's it's actually not as bad as I thought. The, you just have a super restrictive uh, ceremony. Super restrictive ceremony, and I will say some of the th descriptive things I've heard about the ceremony is there's no love involved. There's no talk of when these two first fell in love, mm. and you, you don't really hear stories of the couple. It's yeah. very stale and loveless. Mm. And when you think about marriage in general. It's about the ceremony. Of course, sure. it's the party. But the whole point is to be married and to say your mm. vows. In fact, I don't think you're even allowed to say vows. Mm. I don't think that's a thing. So can I interject the, a little personal story? I am a wedding DJ. I've DJed for, I'm wrapping up my 10th year now here it's in Los intended. Angeles. Yes, uh, SoCal. I'm a SoCal DJ. He's an award-winning award SoCal I mean, DJ in high demand, booked out a year yeah. in advance. I work a lot. I did actually post COVID last year, 71 events. We do all, we do other events, but mostly weddings within a year. I next think week you have a triple. Next Memorial Day weekend, I have a triple, which was very common last year, the post COVID of double, triple weekends. Point is, in the past 10 years, I have, I was doing the math the other day and 400, 400 most events, mostly weddings I've done. And I've seen it all. I've been to every venue and that SoCal <laughs> has to offer. I've seen every kind of couple. So any given wedding day is four parts. You have pre-ceremony ceremony into cocktail hour where you have the drinks, everyone gets nice and loose. And then that leads into a nice dinner. This is kind of riddled mm -hmm. with events too, as, as we know, we've all been to weddings. Um, and then we, the climax of the day is the, the epic dance party. And if you have a great DJ, hopefully it's a great dance party. Mm -hmm. And it's like, a, oh, that was a great day. My favorite part though, and I'll say this because I'm rarely a guest at a wedding, but I, even though I've been to 400 weddings, I still love a good wedding. Like I'm <laughs> always still kind of stoked to go to, to the wedding day and experience it, specifically as a guest, because you're wined and dined and, and people have, have crafted this day in such a way where it's frictionless and we just want you to have a good time. And from the DJ perspective, the dance party is probably my favorite because it's the most creative. That's where I can kind of get in the zone with uh, with the guests and, and, and bring the client's vision to life and all that. But as a guest, my favorite part of the wedding is the ceremony. If you're any given guest, you're getting some insight into the couple from different perspectives from the those giving toast 
And and usually if they're done right and it's like the perfect amount of toast and not too many toasts and it's like you pick the right people, it's like the perfect amount of insights that you're getting into this couple. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. But by the end of it, hopefully you've learned more about them. You feel fulfilled. You're, you're helping celebrate and you feel closer. But the ceremony is the part where if you do the vows, if the couple does the vows, they're declaring not just their love, but their promises in the totality of their life of here's what I want to do. Here's what mm -hmm. I promise to do. And sometimes couples can that like really speak from their heart. That's the part where if it hits just right, like you get teary eyed. You have all the characters of your life that, that you love and care for and cherish all in this concentrated moment in time, helping you celebrate, but specifically listening to the vows and like, okay, I'm going to hold you to that. Yeah. You promised this to, to this person. Ceremony is my favorite part of the day. So it's such a juxtaposition to the restrictive. Not that many people are at temple mm -hmm. ceremony and um, not able to experience that moment, which yeah. I think is the most important moment of the wedding day. Yeah. We can jump into our wedding now. What does a DJ who has seen every possible wedding and has taken notes for 10 <laughs> years with Shelly Sansola? I mean, you as a kid would always have themed parties. I did. Super extra. This is what this is the type of wedding you have when you have two basically creatives who are very extra. Leading up to uh, meeting you and as I was dating, people would always ask me, what is your wedding going to look like? Who's going to DJ your wedding? Those kind of things. And my response, I don't know if I ever told you this, was always, I don't know yet because I haven't met my wife. Aww. It really depends on her and what she wants out of it. I initially wanted to get married in the ruins of some ancient temple in a different country because I also think that speaks to who I am now versus who I was back when I was Mormon. I was not interested in cultures. I was not interested in ancient things. I mean, maybe a little bit. I always loved Egypt, but I didn't have the fascination and respect for indigenous cultures like I do now. So I was 100% thinking that we would get married in Tulum, in a cenote somewhere with a Mayan ceremony. You and I or yeah. your hypothetical husband? Well, Maybe you and I, but also, of course, us girls tend to plan our weddings before we even meet a boyfriend. <laughs> so, I mean, you had your vision boards and I did. <laughs> on Canva. I did. We should put them on the screen. <laughs> Which is where we create our thumbnails. More on that later. Yeah. Um, pretty early on into our relationship. I did. But yeah. I also knew I wanted to marry you like and within I knew, three weeks. I knew within the first month that when I asked you to be my girlfriend, that that was gonna be, end up being it for me mm, yeah. i guess we're not so different from mormons in that way they tend to meet yeah. each other and get engaged super quick we did get engaged after eight months and that is a big theme in our relationship is that it all happened so fast it's, yeah. it's uh when you know you know kind of yeah. thing so but that ends up being the theme that we let the guests kind of in on is how fast everything happened we both created manifestation lists because we were in fact, I was actually in a manifestation course, which I thought was really fun. It was a great way to put my goals down on paper, to see what I wanted right in front of me, making a wish to the universe, if you will. Um, and I had created a list, things that I wanted in a partner. And what was different, this is another good parallel, is what I may have wanted in a partner back when I was 19. In fact, when I thought I was going to get married to this person I'd been with for a year, the whole reason that I left the church because we were bad, quote, bad. I wanted a return missionary. I wanted someone who, which he wasn't, by the way. So already I was being a little bit of a rebel. I wanted someone who would be a good priesthood holder, which means head of the household, worthy enough to bring me through the veil in heaven. Important to note, women can't get into the highest level of heaven unless they have a priesthood holder pull them through the veil. Super misogynistic. Uh, so that's a big deal when women are in a relationship with someone, a man who decides to leave the church. That's why you have so many divorces because the woman is like, well, I need someone to pull me through the veil. I need to find a worthy priest holder. That would have been on my list. And someone who, of course, would be a good dad, which hasn't changed, but it was the focus. And this is when I'm 19 and know that I want to get married right away. Also, because I was one of the person 
people who are super horny and wanted to have sex. So um, my list that I made that eventually brought me Jonathan was, or at least allowed me to see what I wanted in a partner, which some people are like, manifestation isn't real, man, fine. But when you write things down, it allows introspection for one. You actually get out of your brain and kind of workshop the things that you want, which I think are really helpful. And then if you have it out in front of you, a mood board or an inspiration board or a manifestation board, it allows you to constantly remember your goals. So I wrote out this list and it was very different than what I had done in the past. They were all qualities that I knew would help bring me peace in a relationship. Uh, fire, passion was a big one. Now that I was no longer sexually repressed, I'm like, I want someone who I can have great sex with and was unapologetic about it. Asked my brother, he was like, Ugh, during the wedding. <laughs> um, but I just wanted that, that fire, that peace, and someone who could help me raise a family. Mm. And because I'm older too, 33, or I'm about to be 33, at the time, though, you had just 31. turned 31. Just turned 31. So, yeah, I was ready for a family. Um, super old maid in Mormonism's eyes. I should have been married 10 years ago with three kids by now, which it's totally fine if that's the case for you. But that was not my path. I, as Jonathan said, I wanted to be a star. So anyway, we write these lists. And when we met, we discovered that we each wrote a list. The same week. The same week. And for me, at the time... I was kind of a, a serial dater. My intention was to find the right person. Uh, I was similar to you. I wanted kids. I'm 30. Well, I'm 38 now. But at the time, I was I had just turned 37. We're six years apart. And it was time. You know, I had done all the sow your wild oats kind of stuff. I was really ready to find the right person. So similar to you, I wanted to focus in on what it is it that I want out of a partner, mm -hmm. being my partner wish list. We find out after the fact that we made our list the same week. Download the app the same One week. One week later. Within three weeks of both being on the app, we which was very overwhelming, by the way, because you're you're just you're talking to many people and you have this it almost feels like a part-time job responding to people actually going on dates. You were going on like five dates a week. I had told myself one date a week, and that was what I could handle. Um, so it didn't take long before I found you. A month later, will you be my girlfriend? And then eight months later, will you marry me? Mm -hmm. And then 18 months uh, having a wedding. So yeah. when you know, you know. You know what? There is something I want to mention about dating as a Mormon, which is actually easier. I'm going to say easier. Some people may disagree. But the reason it can be easier is because once you turn 18, you are kicked out of the family ward. And when I say kicked out, you... You can't go. And if you go, people are going to be like, why are you here? You need to go to the singles ward. And ward just means congregation. So you go to church specifically with other young single adults. They call it the YSA ward, young single adult ward, who are between 18 and 30. So I say this because once you're 30, they kick you out of the singles ward because you're too old to get married and they put you back in a family ward. So I just, my heart goes out to all of those single adults who are over 30. I would have been kicked out and on my own. So, but what, what happens is because you go to these young single adult wards, you know for a fact, he's Mormon. We're going to agree on the same things. That'll work for me. And it's, that's usually the basis of it. If you find someone that you are attracted to, it's like, get on that. Because not only are you attracted to them, but... They're Mormon. And so automatically you have all these things in common. So that's where I met the guy who I mentioned at 19, where I thought I was going to get married. Now, when I'm not Mormon, it's a whole different thing because now I'm kind of looking for the opposite. I'm like, I don't want someone who's super religious. I just can't do it. That's not my lifestyle. So I remember very specifically on our fourth date, I came to your house and I looked him dead in the eye and I was like, what do you believe? because I need to know if this aligns. I didn't say it specifically like that, but I was gauging his interest in things like a yoga retreat or in plant medicine, which I enjoy and I believe is a very respectful thing to the plant itself and can also bring couples closer and was gauging his interest on um, just the level to which he believes certain things to see if we would mesh because I had had issues in the past 
of people either being too religious or when I was a Mormon, not religious. And I'm like, man, I just got to find someone who I can vibe with. In fact, funny story. <laughs> We've been texting on the app and he's like, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, oh, I have a manifestation course or I have a, a course called Divine Alchemy Academy or something like that. And he goes, does it involve manifesting? And I was like, yes, it does. And he goes, here's my number. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so that's what did it. That's yeah. what my <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're gonna give the people in the comments some room to uh, gripe about our level of woo, woo. <laughs> uh, because we do have a bit of woo. But but ultimately, though, I think this is a good time to bring up that as far as you looking me in the eye and saying what do you believe is, I, uh, and we address this in the my fiance's issues with mm -hmm. my Mormon past, which she can hit here. Have we hit the the limit yet? On I don't how many? Know. We have five five <laughs> cards we could put up. I think we're on number three. And I told you, I was raised Catholic, probably around 15. I was like, can't do this. And I've been agnostic ever since. We don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, but also um, open. Who knows? You know? Yeah. M maybe there is a celestial kingdom. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. What I wanted to gauge with you specifically was how open are you to exploring? Oh, because yeah. Because also... I had dated people who were just like, you want to talk about aliens? Pfft, that's dumb. And I'm like, well, why not just have discussions? I sure. love curious discussions. What if this? What if that? Babe, if aliens existed and they came down and wanted to like infiltrate society, what would you do? Like, even if it's not on a realistic thing, it's just something yeah. fun to talk about. And you are very open and curious and you love to play. Yeah. And I think also with your creative storytelling perspective, it can be fun and playful. And that's basically what I wanted. Someone who I can play with, be curious with, be open with, tell anything, run ideas by, and you're never going to judge me for it. I think that's one of the things we love about this channel <laughs> is that we can explore the curiosities within discussion mm -hmm. with people that have things to say. Let's talk about the wedding. <laughs> so yeah. I know we've been trying. This is all relevant, though. And I think it's important to draw the parallels because that's basically what we're doing sure. here. So now we can get into the more fun, wild and crazy stuff that so, actually happened on our wedding. Yes, I think it starts with this because once it was clear that I was going to propose and you got to building up that vision board of what yeah. the wedding could look like, I remember you started with a certain vision, which was like on a rooftop, very L.A. with like the skyline. That was once you decided or said that we should stay in L.A. instead of going out into a different country like right. Bermuda. Or and also we were thinking very budget friendly. Yeah. So a place that was more like a like a stu like a photography studio, like yeah. something where you can just like go to the roof and come down and have the reception. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was totally cool with all of that. You bought the wedding dress or you were on the road to buying the wedding dress. And this yeah. was a, this was a whole thing where <laughs> I could not see the wedding dress fair, totally fair until the moment of the wedding day where we had the first look and it was pretty epic. It was really sweet. He Here's a photo of me crying when I see her for the first time in her wedding dress. You're like, what do you think of this? This vision that you were already starting to build. And I was like, well, any great story has a theme and it has a kernel of something. And to me, in my experience with weddings, it's the wedding dress. It all starts with the wedding dress because that is a representation of the bride. And then from there, the everything else, it's the accent piece of the whole thing. From there, mm -hmm. you can figure out what the, what the wedding venue is going to be. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, if there's going to be a theme to and feel a tone mm -hmm. to the wedding itself, whether it's like more formal or it's more laid back, if we're in a backyard, you know, that kind of thing. So when you showed me that, or when you were telling me about that bomb ass dress from <laughs> Gali Lahav and, and what it could be. And it was super expensive. And I was like, babe, it sounds like this is not fitting with the venue that we got. And yeah. then that got your wheels turning. Yeah. So going back and there's a couple stories here. The first being I mentioned I wanted something with history. And that was my major gripe with L.A. is that they don't really have historic buildings unless they're churches and you can't. And do I want to marry in a church? No, not really. Even though I love the architecture of cathedrals. I wanted something with history, with personality, and I wanted something that was not a wedding factory. I, my worst fear is being basic. And I just could not get married in a place that a bunch of other brides that week even got married in. I just wanted something different. So I'll go back to that in a second. The dress, I had told myself, you know what? Costumes are my thing. I'm literally a costumer in Los Angeles and I've been making costumes forever. I just think it's so fun. I majored in fashion design 
And I'm older to where I can say, you know what, I'm going to spend a lot of money on my wedding dress because that's important to me. That's something that would really represent me and people would expect it. And people did. They would say, oh, my gosh, I cannot wait to see what her dress is like based on knowing me. So we go to Gali Lahav, and this was just supposed to be a fun little, we'll try on dresses, but we won't buy anything because it's too expensive. It was even above what I had set, which was a pretty high limit already. So we go there, and I'm just having the time of my life with my mom, throwing on these dresses. I tried lots of different silhouettes. I tried the big, poofy um, princess dress, which I thought I wanted. It was actually tulle sheer, and you could see your legs underneath, super sexy. Was not it. Coco was out. Coco is my nickname for my butt. Out of I don't control. think this audience knows they that. They don't know that. <laughs> you can go to my social media and find out what that's about. Um, <laughs> so Learning so much about Shalice and Sola. <laughs> hey, um, so I come out in this dress and I'll put a picture on the screen. Maybe I'll even put the, the video of me walking out for the first time in the dress. It's spaghetti strap. It's super low cut in the front and it is beaded, just encrusted with beads. And it has this beautiful brocade design, swirly design with lace and a crosshatch pattern, which is very art deco. And so I walked out and I looked in the mirror and I had an immediate response emotionally. And I got really choked up. And I, I guess I could share this because it's it's relevant to childhood trauma. But I remember looking in the mirror and saying to myself, who do you think you are that you could wear a dress this beautiful? When you saw yourself for the first time? In the dress. Wow. Because it was so stunning and I had such an emotional response. My first thought was unworthiness. And it was a really powerful moment because since I've been doing all this work to unwind this programming of you're not good enough or you look slutty, Right. And Mormons would say, or at least not the judge, judgmental ones would look at that and say, you look slutty because you're not covering your shoulders. It's super low cut. You can see a little bit of cleavage like I have cleavage anyway. And because I had been doing all this deconstruction work already, I immediately countered it with, of course, you are worthy enough to wear this dress. Of course. Why wouldn't you be able to wear this dress? You look incredible. This dress was made for you. And in that moment, I was like, I'm getting this dress. I'm probably getting this dress. And it was expensive. It was really expensive. But it was such a beautiful moment. And looking back to especially the pictures, guys, we got our wedding album back two days ago. And I'm gushing because all I wanted to do was Vogue in that dress all over the theater. Editorial style. (laughs) Editorial style because I I grew up modeling, doing photo shoots. Like, that's my thing. I just love being in front of the camera. That was my another self expression thing that I always craved when I was young, being in front of the camera, dancing, whatever. So that knowing that I could have that moment and feel so connected and have that dress be such a representation of me and this era that I was obsessed with. I literally said in the video, who do you, who do I think I am? Marilyn Monroe, like right immediately when I walked out. It's so funny. And so it was this old Hollywood, just like dripping with glam. And there started the old Hollywood glam theme wedding Mm -hmm. that we threw. Mm -hmm. So we encouraged our guest to dress the part. It was any decade. Didn't have to like be the 20s. to the 50s. Because usually when people do that, they they harp on the 1920s Gatsby style. But this yeah. was like any decade of old Hollywood, 30s to 60s. Um, Formal. Just glam it up. But the venue itself, I think, is the one of the yeah. main characters of this piece because it, you found this place. Yeah. It's atypical in that they don't have many events there, but they film a lot there. So it has it's rich already because it was a movie palace. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I learned through this process is that in downtown Los Angeles, so there's a street called Route 66, a road. So that goes from, you know, the the east. I think actually where I'm from, Chicago, yeah. all the way to the ocean, Santa the Monica. Pacific. So that road would run through downtown Los Angeles and it's a street called Broadway. Back in the day, by back in the day, I mean the 1930s, a lot of the downtown area wasn't built out yet, Mm -hmm. but the attraction was this road. Broadway. It was Broadway. So cars would would drive through, like the old Model T cars. And so there was like, that's where you get the marquees with the the lights and everything. So a a night out would be going to go to the The theater. theater. (laughs) The theater. This place that we picked is an old movie palace that was built specifically in 1931. 
1931. Yeah. And I love that you love I love the history so history much. Guys. So much. I don't mean you, to correct you. I just love you it. You did <laughs> such a deep dive into I did. the spirit of this place. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. So um the energy that was packed into this venue. When we walked in for the first time, it was palpable. It definitely felt haunted. Love that so um, much. It was uh, it was a place that felt like it needed to be brought to life. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, they they, they film there a lot. A lot of, in fact, the traveling that we've been doing lately, yeah. we're just watching movies on the airplane, and I'm like, babe. This, it seemed this like, is our theater. Like every other movie, this is our theater. we would pause it and be like, that's our lobby. That's the ballroom. Like it, everything everywhere all at once. I um, want to dance with somebody had a scene in there. The artist. Um, there was a movie, Babylon, that I just watched with oh, Brad Pitt. Right. And I was like, babe. That's, that's our that's theater. A, um, <laughs> American Idol. It's a very opulent theater. You walk in and you are greeted with this big lobby with chandeliers, 50 foot the ceilings. plaster work is very intricate Gold. and you immediately see this grand staircase with this mezzanine balcony mm -hmm. that is just begging to do something with it. You walk past it and you have these beautiful auditorium doors that open up into this magnificent auditorium yeah. that has such the way it's lit, like it you just has a certain energy to it and also is begging to have something happen on that stage. Yeah. And the, a 50 foot curtain. It's the largest curtain in Los Angeles in a movie theater. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to wrap around to is I wanted a place with history. And I've always been obsessed with the 20s and the 30s and the finger waves. And I've had so many photo shoots in that era because I just always feel like I should have been born in that time period. So it just felt so fitting. And also the old Hollywood thing, wanting to be a star and, you know, literally be the star of the story, which we both were. And on that note, when we chose this place, I was so excited. So, so, so excited. I just started thinking of all the things that we could do because it's a movie theater. It's a movie palace. Literally, that's what they were called in the 30s. It was the last one built on Broadway and went bankrupt almost immediately. In fact, Charlie Chaplin premiered his film City Lights on opening day of the theater and put his own money into the theater so that it could open because it almost didn't even open. So, so much history. Einstein was in attendance that night. I thought that's a fun fact. And when I walked in, it just kept going. There's like three floors down. There's a ballroom down there. The the ladies' bathroom is probably one of my most favorite rooms. I'm going to put a picture here and you guys are going to be like, that's not the bathroom. It's the bathroom. They call it the powder room. The powder room. It's a circular 360 mirrors. Blush pink walls with gold trim. Yeah. So stunning. So it's definitely a place, a venue where it's meant to be explored. It's inviting you to do that. And it has an energy to it. So we found our spot. We found the dress. What kind of party do we want to throw? Yeah. I think for me... What was important was throwing a wedding that was authentic to us. Having the people that we wanted there was super important to us. So I'm the extrovert. You're the extroverted introvert. You would have been okay with a, with a smaller, more intimate wedding. I wanted everyone I could possibly have a connection <laughs> with in my life. Having a wedding that didn't feel like it was a job, like it was a gig. So part of that was it being an atypical wedding venue. And also understanding the psychology of throwing a good party, how we can keep our guests entertained, the value of a surprise. Yeah. I think I think it was important to us to, to have the hits keep on coming, mm -hmm. where it's how do you keep people engaged every half hour? What are we going to do to level up what would just happened? So I guess, should we just walk mm -hmm. through what the wedding day looked like? Yeah. Okay, so you're a guest, you show up, you're wearing your glam. Well, first, our names are on the marquee. Our names are on the marquee. We call their day La Boda. The so wedding in Spanish. It means the wedding in Spanish. We kept telling our guests in the website that we made, that we also feel pretty proud of, that they're invited to the premiere of La Boda. Because it's in a movie theater. Knowing that they're thinking, okay, they're invited to the ceremony. And this yeah. Is, you know, they're being kitschy. You go in, you get your ticket. Which from is the, the original box office, from the original, which is still there. From Will Call. Yeah. And then you immediately go into the red carpet experience. Yes. Now, there are movie posters that we made of us looking like 1930s stars. Uh -huh. So people are like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> so we got to kind of sit there and take photos in via poster form with everybody that walked to the red carpet. But yeah. also everyone got a really cool photo, of, photo themselves. of themselves as they were coming in. So then you go in and you're immediately greeted by 
um, five piece swing band led by Amanda Castro, mm -hmm. which we had gone on a date months prior just to check it out. And we were like, Stunned. she's amazing. They're amazing. So good. So the pre-ceremony, I've always loved that as a DJ because that pre-ceremony is the anticipatory energy where things you can feel things brewing it sets the tone for the kind of day you're going to have so when you walk into this lobby which now there is a champagne, champagne tower, tower <laughs> and there are the Usherettes. usherettes handing out popcorn vintage costumes we'll put a picture up because they're so cute because we had a, a popcorn machine guy and they're handing out popcorn they you have, have your, their movie ticket your movie in ticket hand. in hand the band's playing the theater lobby is lit up so that was we, really important to us so the lighting huge. we didn't want any decorations like the stuff in the middle of the tables was so minimal i was like i don't want to waste my money on decor this place speaks for itself we had like a 600 hundred dollar floral budget like, yeah that was the we the weren't even gonna amount. have florals and i was like yeah. all right let's just pay for a few roses <laughs> yeah the budget that we had was geared toward lighting, lighting. let's bring this place venue, venue to, life. to life so hand your ticket into uh the usherette at you collect your popcorn and then you go into the auditorium and you sit and wait and then we had in the original movie theater seats which were so cool and also to paint a picture of the curtain that's in front of them while they sit down and wait, it is this depiction of King Louis, the some kind of number that I forgot, in 3D. So it's this stunning tapestry. depiction, this tapestry with actual fabric coming out of the curtain for the dresses from they the women. They say it's the most expensive curtain that a palace could have, like the an old theater palace. could have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the most expensive and important piece of the entire theater. Yeah. So that was going to be the backdrop for the ceremony. Yeah. By the way, our lighting team killed it. So the, the venue looked stunning when it was we were really curious to see what it would look like on wedding day and they did not mm -hmm. disappoint. Um, so this is probably the most one of the more interesting parts, I think, is how do, how do you describe Dalen? He's the art director of the theater. So we were given his information to maybe help with some of the details, which we ended up not doing because we were so passionate and hands-on we did every detail ourselves but he knows the history of the theater really well and he also puts on these performances as a character so he was pretend playing a piano that is on the stage this upright old-fashioned piano and then he did a little bit where the piano keeps playing and as he stands up and it's like oh whoops you know kind of silly and then talked a little bit about the history of the theater in full costume in full costume meanwhile Jonathan and I and our wedding party are upstairs in the balcony because... So I want to take a, a break from being in present day mode and take us back to what led to this moment. Yeah. We wanted to surprise our guests with a short, silent film, black and white. 1930s style. 1930s style of our love story. Sounds pretty cool, right? <laughs> Well, the pressure that led to that, because we were already throwing this kind of big wedding, now we had to produce a short film <laughs> on top of that. This wasn't like, this was a 14 minute film. Like, this is something we actually had to have like a shooting script for, had to Wait, edit. I have to say, because when I first brought it up, when I thought about it, it was like, oh my gosh, we're getting married in a theater. What if we actually had them watch a film and i thought he was gonna be like babe you're so extra and he was like let's do it because he's a director and filmmaker and i'm an actress so of course i want to see myself on a big screen and he wants to hone his skills so he was down and then he was like babe it's not gonna be anything crazy we're just gonna do like a five minute <laughs> film and i'm like okay that's fine he writes the script and he's like babe it's 12 pages <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. Well, in order minutes. to tell it right, you yeah. know, you don't ever want to restrict yourself. You're just like, let it come out and then let's see what it wants to be. That's one of my mottos. What does the piece want to be? And that piece wanted to be 12 minutes on page, 14 <laughs> minutes on screen. Yeah, but it was so good. I mean, I mean, the cur so we're probably going to do something with it, like submit it to yeah, festivals, right? Maybe because we'll it was show. Like, I remember like halfway through production, and I, this was a true production, the, I was like, Babe, this is turning into something way bigger this is than actually I think good. it was. Supposed. This is actually pretty, <laughs> pretty decent. Yeah. Um, so um, that was such a, a big surprise for. And by the way, you did all the costuming I in did. that. That and was fun. That's probably my favorite part of that short film. I would love to. We probably could show clips of we'll that, show right? A clip yeah, of yeah. It, yeah. But um, I would love to have that out already. 
But I think because we probably are going to do something with festivals, festivals are pretty adamant about wanting to be the ones to uh, have the exclusive and release something. So yeah. eventually that whole 14 minute piece will be out. But I'm very proud of that. So here we are in the balcony uh -huh. overlooking this vision that, that we brought to life all of our loved ones below, knowing that they have no idea that they're about to watch this film. Dalen finishes his piece. He introduces the film. The lights dim. The curtain, curtain draws. <laughs> the light, the, <laughs> the countdown to the film goes. And yeah, it, it was, was so, so rewarding. Cool. Like hearing the, the laughs, the awes, reacting exactly how we wanted them to. It was so much fun. The coolest part about this it was the chronology of our love story, and it was done in 1930 style. So we mm -hmm. tell you that we met on Hinge. There was one point where you're like, babe, this is all cool. We're able to turn all of our story into an old timey old -timey piece. Version. But how do we get past this phone swiping thing? You had the brilliant idea of why don't we have Hinge be a matchmaking service <laughs> that uh, someone is the headquarters, there's a headquarters and there's someone in charge and there's a book that everyone gets and you can rifle the through pages, the, the pages, the profiles. the profiles. And what I love about what we did with this short film was that because it was a chronology of our love story from when we met on Hinge all the way up to the proposal, we're having subtitles throughout. Yeah, title it, cards. Title cards. And then there's a scene that you wanted to have, which was like, and just when people think it's over, we reprise, we come back in the film where now you're showing me the venue itself the venue that, that we're actually at. <laughs> so you're like, and then we can have our names on the marquee. And then you're kind of walking me through what the wedding's gonna look like. And then the band will be yeah. over here. <laughs> and then you take me to the stage and you're like, we'll get married here. And then you turn around to the screen behind us in the film, the screen that the people are watching the film on. And you're like, and we'll have a movie of our love story, you know? <laughs> So it was super meta. That film ends with us hugging, embracing on the stage, getting ready for the next step, which is going to be the wedding. And then the next title card you see is the wedding. And then the lights come back on. And they're in. The curtain goes down. <laughs> and they're in the third act of the film. Yeah. The film has come to life. That's my favorite part. So we're up there getting ready for us to continue the, the ceremony. Yeah. Little did I know. Yeah. So I'm up there trying to enjoy this short film, but I am panicking a little bit on the inside because I had been keeping this secret from Jonathan for the 10 months. Actually, before that, I was like, I'm going to do this on the wedding day. I was super extra and decided to sing down the aisle. So I was initially going to walk down with my mom. Uh, I love her so much. You've probably seen the episodes with her. She's amazing. But then she was like, you know what? I think you should walk down independently because you don't need anyone to give you away and you should just own that moment. I don't want to pull focus from you. And so, you didn't want a bouquet. I did not want, guys, I spent way too much money on a dress to hide it with a big old thing of flowers. So I just walked down solo with a microphone singing to Jonathan a song that I had sang to him in the past and it was an emotional time. And I was like, oh, I should sing that, which was. So this is love. I immediate tears, immediate <laughs> tears. I have out of the 400 weddings that I've been a part of, I have never seen a bride serenade a groom down the aisle <laughs> on her way as she's processing to get married. Yeah. Everybody was like, this is amazing. Yeah. I think the worst part about that for me was I... I somehow got Jonathan to agree to having a pianist for our ceremony so that I could have someone in real time accompany me. But I had never practiced with this pianist. He's this incredible musician. He's well known. Underground LA. Yeah. So he was very expensive and he was trying to charge $500 just to do a single practice for an hour. And I was like, I can't afford that. I guess I'm gonna go in blind. So essentially, I was the one that provided all of the ceremony yeah. equipment. And then the, we had, there's a lot of moving pieces. We had the band, your mom officiated. Yeah. Ian at our at the company that I work with was kind of the MC for the reception part. But it, it was atypical in that many people kind of hosted different parts of the day. I was in charge of bringing in all the equipment for the DJ stuff. So, but you didn't know if my, the microphone would even reach it was all the way far back, back at the in, auditorium. In singing. So you had a lot to worry about. And I even got one of his groomsmen who was also was also a DJ in your company to come early and help me sound check. But the thing was, because there were so many people in the room, apparently the 
the water in people's bodies affects the range. Apparently everyone loved it. And I was just like, I didn't feel my best, but it's fine because I think I just struck everyone it, with emotion that they forgot to listen to the pitch. And we had we had follow <laughs> spots on people, the yeah. wedding party coming in. So it was very like, poof. the ceremony was beautiful. Your mom did a great job. She nailed it. Yeah, that was a really good personal touch. I brought up the importance of, our, of my mother because our mothers are very important to us. I actually got to read a poem for the first time that I wrote three weeks after meeting Jonathan. I was flying home from Utah and I missed him so much. And I wrote this poem about how everything's happening so fast, but I can't ignore it. And I just loved him so much and I didn't know what to do with mm. it. And I saved that in my phone and I never showed it to him. And I was like, maybe I'll show it to him at a significant part of our lives. And then when he proposed, I was like, sounds like a pretty good time to do it at the wedding. Yeah. So it was really really heartfelt and special and i loved having to go back to the mormon thing everybody there to witness it and yeah. be a part of that and be able to even say that poem which i could have done let's i don't want to say that i couldn't have shared that with him separately if we had a traditional mormon wedding in the temple i could have written it down later but there was something really special about people being able to witness me telling him that for yeah. the first time and and also this little the guy ween. the wee mr myers oscar myers well the beauty of it was that he was a, almost a main character in that short film he was. he's a show dog he does he's a hollywood dog so he's trained and we met on set yeah you guys met on set yeah. he's very uh camera ready <laughs> and he definitely shined in that short film he did so one of the things you did was create a matching suit to my suit, <laughs> which was like an, an, an assorted fashioned. 1930s. Like there was a vest, there was a, a jacket. Waist uh, chain. Waist chain. He had our rings strapped to his waist chain. And there was the moment where, who has the rings? And then he came running out with running the rings. On people stage. got to see him with my, <laughs> the matching outfits. And you killed it, Mr. Ween. He killed it. But yeah, what was that like having a wedding party? Kind of just wrap this back around to the not so Mormon wedding versus having a wedding party when you do have a Mormon wedding. From the weddings that I've witnessed, you can still have a wedding party and even have bridesmaids dresses, but it's kind of irrelevant because the ceremony, like there's no ceremony that they can really be a part of in their clothes anyway. So I think it's just honoring them specifically and saying you're special wear this color and people will know that you're special or here's a dress and you can look like you're special but there's no real duties for the bridesmaids gotcha as far as uh clothing though there there is restrictions in the reception for the wedding party or there isn't the only restriction would be modesty mm. so i had a lot of fun designing my bridesmaids dresses i didn't design them specifically the vision for it picking it out yeah i had a lot of fun they were all in black and gold sequin very glamorous it it was basically old fashioned but with a modern fit so everyone was just hourglass figure stunning they all had red lips old fashioned hair i'm gonna put the photo of us on the stairs right now because it is just so good and everyone looked amazing so that was a lot of fun being able to create and design that vision. Mm. Kind of just to walk through quickly what the rest of the wedding looked like. People recessed to the back to the lobby, which was then flipped because we wanted to have a very atypical cocktail dinner where that was very not formal. So we had yeah. lounge tables. It felt we wanted it to feel like an old lounge or comedy club. So we just had yeah. high tops and low tops, unassigned seating. And the band at this point was roaring. They were just into so it. So good. And the dancers. The, and the dancers. The, the usherettes turned into to and like dancers. Full, full costumes. headdresses. They did. And, and they were interacting fans. with the crowd. And there was like yeah. a, a, would you call it conga a conga line? line? <laughs> yeah. The, we had the horns and the drums. Yeah. I mean, like there was so much packed into it. It was everything we wanted it to be. We had our, my mom gave a toast. My brother gave a toast. Your brothers gave a toast. It wasn't too long. It was a perfect amount of time. They all complimented each other, all gave the perfect amount of insight into us, yeah. which is what we wanted. Furniture rental was very important to you. Yes, I wanted that vintage furniture. So the theater had already purchased. It's not actually vintage. It's just a replica. It's um, 
I wish I remember the exact name, but it's some sort of French revolution yeah. <laughs> furniture. Very Marie Antoinette. Yeah, yeah. So gorgeous uh, sculptural stuff, which is all hand carved in Egypt, actually, and it shipped over. So the theater already had some furniture like that. We were connected with the exact same company who normally doesn't rent, but allowed us to supplement some more furniture. So yeah. we had our own little love seat where we sat at the bottom of the stairs all the way towards the back and got to yeah. see everything. When you walk down to the ballroom, which is where this party leads to, after the dinner and two the stories toast. down well before you even get to the ballroom there is um, a like half floor mm -hmm. and we decided to have our version of a photo booth there which was instead of having the whole come up with little mustache and the hat or the, <laughs> the i'm props. here with the bride props we wanted to have our guests leave with professional photos so we had a professional photographer kind of editorial setup with that vintage fur furniture yeah. be able to take photos of people so we had a whole setup so that was our version of a photo so they booth. could feel like a star yeah. too so they had the red carpet photos and they had that photo yeah you walk down to the ballroom and this is magnificent oval ballroom which they film at a lot yeah and that's where the the these epic bathrooms are yeah. the, the powder room <laughs> and it was lit spectac spectacularly with more vintage furniture lining the outside so this is probably the most nerve-wracking part <laughs> of our wedding was this moment because we were going to kick off our dance party with parent dances you're you were going to dance with your mother and i was going to dance with my mother and then we were going to do our first dance us being extra we couldn't just have a normal Side to side, rocking back and now, forth. Now, when I tell you how many clients of mine tell me, Jonathan, just so you know, we're doing a bit of a choreographed dance. Like we have a choreographer. I need you to cut an edit of the song for me. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. One, two, three, four. Left, right. Shalice is a dancer. I'm a dancer. Not professional, but we are passionate about dancing. Like we've been dancing our whole lives. Like In you did. In fact, fun. yeah, I grew up with studio dance and Utah is famous for great dancers. Ding, just kidding. Drill team. But that's actually how I trapped Jonathan initially is because he saw a uh, an excerpt of me salsa dancing on my birthday yeah. on my profile. And he was like, hmm, did I just find my next salsa partner? And I rolled my eyes. Opening line because you thought I was just like any other guy that they claims say they, they can, can dance. dance. And salsa is hard, can. by the way. I, I yeah. appreciate, I have appreciated a lot of partner dances and salsa was the one that was just like, I, I don't feel the most confident, comfortable with yeah. this one. So I was already impressed with you. Going back to our first date that night, when you revealed to me that you were going on five dates a week, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, well I have to show you I can dance. Like, Tonight. tonight so i even <laughs> i was very forthright and just revealing i was i even told you my plan i'm like i need to show you my dance moves tonight so we went to and and this is something that was depicted in our short film yeah opened up the the car door we were under a street light where Beverly we had Hills. parked at the end of the night late night after our, our beautiful date and we had the street light spotlight on us opened the car door we put on i put on a bachata song prince roy stand by me yeah we both in that moment were like yeah, there's something here. I melted into his arms and uh, yeah. people may say I'm still melting. So that's how I trapped. <laughs> that's how I trapped you. Yeah. So we wanted our, our first dance. We wanted to recreate that by starting what ended up being a four minute six genre mashup dancing with the star style. First dance. I put on a salsa dress, like an actual performance, white covered with fringe and Swarovski crystals. Uh, salsa dress. I had the tights with yeah. crystals on them and salsa shoes and everything. In fact, I very specifically said that I wanted to have my hair in a way that when we did this salsa dance, this first dance, it would still look awesome the rest of the night because my hair is naturally pin straight. And I knew that if I curled it and we danced, I would look freaking crazy afterwards. So I opted for the slick back bun, which is I actually hired a ballroom stylist to come and do my hair. <laughs> so it did not go anywhere for this first dance. When I tell you practicing and choreographing what this six genre four minute and four minutes is a lot for any dancer. It's a long time. I mean, you have to have the stamina and we haven't danced like that in a no. long time. Well, even when I was competing in high school, the longest we would ever go is maybe three minutes, 15 seconds. And we were exhausted. And we were, so I, I, I whipped up an edit of what these songs were that we wanted. So the genres were we went from bachata, salsa, salsa. to a, a hip hop. Charleston kind of vibe to reggaeton, which was a lot of fun for people, which is like Latin hip hop in a way, to 
an epic swing high energy dance number at the end to close it out and give the exclamation point. Yes. Then our our moms are like, well, we want to do something. And then my mom was like, well, I want to do cumbia, which is a different genre and floor core me- Mexican dancing because it was part of our backstory. And then you and your mom wanted to do the Charleston. My mom's so, a dancer. And then I was like, mom, because you were going to go first and you got you and your mom killed it. We're so showing good. you footage now. And you guys practiced. You came up with something great. And for me, leading up to this was, mom, you do know that I have like this whole other four minutes that I'm going to do after this, like immediately <laughs> after this. So you're, we're basically adding two more two minutes. minutes. I'm going to go nonstop hard. So all that to say that we were producing a short film. <laughs> we were planning this epic wedding. And then on top of that, we were nonstop practicing for well, a month leading up to the wedding. What is this choreographed special dance is going to look like? But might I say, we had the salsa and bachata choreographed. Well, we had the salsa choreographed. Uh, one of our good friends helped us. Another one helped clean it. We had had that part for maybe two months. So after we would work out, we would go into the dance room and practice that part. And it was it was difficult because it was a very intense salsa number. And you were also still learning salsa. I mean, you picked it up really quickly, but there was a lot of stuff to kind of fine tune. And then we got the bachata maybe a month before the wedding. And then we still have all these other genres to go like three minutes left. I wasn't worried. And he wasn't worried. And I was like, as a dancer, Babe, we have to know this choreography. Like I, when I learn to dance and perform, I've known that dance for months and we don't even know it. We finished choreographing that last part of the dance the week before, like not even like five days before. To do that dance for four minutes. Yes, it was a lot. And we got sweaty and we knew it was going to be a lot. But practicing it leading up to it was so intense because we're like, again, again, I normally don't have issues with my knees. I needed knee braces. So I'm like, babe, this is like, we're going for hours every single day. It was challenging. There was a part where I taught you some lifts that I learned in high school. Yeah, and then you wanted to throw lifts in there. We had to do the lifts, guys. You gotta throw the lifts and the swing. swing. Swing, by the way, was my genre that I learned when I was 21. You taught me salsa, I taught you swing, basically. So I taught him this lift and we're practicing in the gym and we get a little bit too too much momentum and he launches me across the gym. I land on my knee. This is a couple days before. Two days before the wedding. Oh, if you looked close, you could see the giant black Actually, bruise on my knee. There was an episode of Cult of Consciousness where you were talking to some, I forget which episode it was, and I should know, where you had a big bruise <laughs> on your right shoulder. And I'm like, babe, <laughs> people are going to think, ah, that's the reason the why. It was from the first dance practicing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was very much what we wanted, which was like, but wait, there's more. There's more. Like, they're, like they're, the hits Singing, just keep dancing, on coming. acting. One of my favorite parts was the actual dance party, because dance parties as a wedding DJ are super important to me. We had at our wedding, all seven DJs from our company, including myself, I hopped on the decks. I'm from Chicago. I had a big part of my family that wanted to hear Chicago house music. I even got my set in there. Yeah. And we threw an epic dance party with seven DJs. We had seven DJs at our our wedding. And then I changed again. You changed again. And this was another fun little moment for me to shine and share my, my talents with everybody which was I designed and built, sewed my own jumpsuit that actually matched and mimicked my wedding dress. I, when I saw this, it looked like it was an actual piece that you can get somewhere because the design was so... Thanks, babe. Yeah, no, you... The last thing I want to say about this day that we, or this weekend that we created, because we had our bachelor and bachelorette party, which was Mm -hmm. a whole other party that we had to create um, on that Thursday. And then the Friday, we had the rehearsal with our wedding party and everybody that was involved with the ceremony. And um, my, my my parents um, helped facilitate the, the dinner there Friday. So that was like a whole other kind of mini party to throw. And then our wedding day. We wanted to have all of our family and friends in one centralized location. If the venue itself was a character, I would say... The other main character was the hotel, Mm -hmm. the Haas building that was directly across the street here in downtown LA on this street on Broadway, 30 second walk. We thought it would be cool. It was an old bank building that was then converted into apartment buildings. It was remodeled. So it had that industrial concrete loft loft feel, then turned into a hotel. And we wanted to have everybody in there 
So that was a big part of the experience. The wedding planning experience was connecting with all the people and trying to Tetris where everyone was going to be and making sure there are SVP, making sure yeah. that they were connecting with the hotel. Um, they had this penthouse. The top floor, huge, beautiful penthouse. 17,000 square feet. There was a pool up there, a basketball court. Like you could see all of downtown. You can look and see our venue, wedding venue. We'll put with some a, photos of us on the rooftop. With our marquee. And we. it was important for us to have an after party up there where we kept our guests up till sunrise. So yeah, we just, we did it. It was epic. All of that to say, these are my takeaways, mm. if I may tie it back around. One thing that I had to let go of after being Mormon was realizing that I wasn't an old maid for not being married already. Most of my friends uh, who are still living in Utah and still practicing in the faith were married with three kids. Like some of my friends have three kids, some mm. have four. And just feeling like I was really behind, even though living in California, I intellectually knew that wasn't true. People are looking at me, they're like, really? You're not supposed to be married yet. You're in your 20s. But I had to get rid of this idea that I wasn't good enough or that people didn't find me valuable going into the purity culture. Are men going to find me less attractive because I have slept with other people. That was a big thing, letting go of that. And just finally owning myself and saying, no, you're awesome. You just haven't found the perfect person. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, I am so happy that I waited Aww. to find you, my love, because you are the perfect person for me. You're gonna make me cry again. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> and you compliment me, you lift me up, when I told you that I was broken up with by Mormons on Mushrooms, you were my number one champion. No one breaks up with Shalise. <laughs> Let's start your own podcast. You're a huge, huge reason that this podcast even exists for all of these people to enjoy and listen to. And you behind the scenes have been the driving force behind this. So people don't really know because you just see me in front of the camera. Jonathan is in the back scheming telling me I need to send emails and helping me send emails to reach out to guests, um, potential get potential guests. And okay, what's what's the strategy now? Because we just have so many big plans and ideas for this channel. So you've been a huge, huge part of that. And I love you so Thank much. Thank you, babe. And I'm just Thank so happy so that we I could love have you. I love you. That we could have the wedding that was truly tailored for us. No one telling us what we could or couldn't do. No one putting restrictions on it, especially my clothes. I would have been so livid if I just couldn't express myself fully um, with those limitations. And, you know, having the dirty songs playing, twerking my ass oh, off, boy. may I yeah. add. Which you learned a lot of that. You took a twerking class for we did a the Bachelorette. Class. Party, yeah, right? it was so much fun. Yeah. So I'm like doing the push up twerks. I'm twerking into the splits. I thought for sure that that jumpsuit was going to There was a moment half. in the dance party where you're twerking because the dancing didn't stop <laughs> after the first dance. <laughs> it did not. Where well, you're twerking and there's you're, there's a circle around you, uh -huh. you guess. And I come and I just come sliding underneath on the floor, <laughs> underneath your open legs. And as he slid <laughs> under, guys, we both had the idea to hit the music because that's who of we course. are. So I went down. Right as I hit, hit the, the spot. We smacked heads so hard. I had a bump on my head and it hurt for like a week. I think all of the dings and bruises it that this wedding it. was totally worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. So. Everyone who came to the wedding said, I could not have imagined a more you and Jonathan wedding because yeah. we were able to showcase all of our talents, our passions, our hobbies, what makes us excited, our creativity, mm. and tailor this experience for the guests that, in their words, was unforgettable. And it's just so exciting to be able to do that while also professing my undying love for you. Love it, baby. Yeah. I mean, would you have even dated me if I was an active Mormon? Being a self-proclaimed open person, agnostic, I think I was open to someone who was in a religion. I've, as I stated in our previous episode, I feel like I have met a lot of Exmos. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I know now about Mormonism, I probably wouldn't 
have married and I mean you, a Mormon probably wouldn't have wanted to date me anyway right I mean who wouldn't you're so sexy oh boy but babe. they wouldn't <laughs> have wanted to it depends on the person yeah I mean I think I think what happens often is they are told that they should marry within their religion um, and even actually specifically within their own race <laughs> so you're a double whammy yeah I'm um, a Lamanite no <laughs> Is that, no, is that a, no, because you're not Native American. Oh, wait, wait. But you, I am cursed with the dark skin. You were technically not as valiant in the pre-existence. Yeah, I don't know if I would have been able to be cool with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. from what I learned from Calvin about the FLDS. Uh-huh, or the, the original Mormon teachings. Yeah, yeah. What is yeah. it, white delight? Uh, white and delightsome. Yeah. <laughs> white I, don't, I don't know if I would have <laughs> sat well with me. It sounds like an alcoholic drink or something. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the white delight. Um, um so, yeah, I think I would have learned quickly that it probably wouldn't have worked out with, yeah. with a Mormon. It was either yeah. date within your own religion or flirt to convert. So if you have to marry mm. them, if you love them enough, then just make sure you convert them and then it's fine. Gotcha. Well, I think we should definitely get into the channel updates. Yeah. And I, I think this is a good time to, as we're segueing into channel updates and what we want to do with this channel, um, we are not an anti-religious channel right that's not i think that's something that's come up so we both look at the comments all the time just so you know reading all the comments that come in and um sometimes i i see that and i think i asked you at one point i'm like are you anti-religious or anti-mormon is that what we're doing here and my response was no i am not anti-religious because i do think that certain religions provide comfort and security and happiness and joy to people who are in them what I am anti is manipulation and coercion, which just so happens tends to fall within the lines of most religions. So my whole goal with the channel was not to say religion is bad and don't do it. It's to expose the dark underbelly of these religions or groups, not even just religions, groups that are coercing their members into thinking believing, feeling, acting, behaving a certain way and try to give people the permission to self-govern, to have individual sovereignty, to be conscious enough to understand that they can create their own reality and they don't need anyone else telling them how to live or what to be, especially when the only reason behind those things is something that we don't know even exists in the afterlife, which is usually what most people are doing those things for, is for a promise that they don't know for sure if it's going to actually come true. So a lot of people ask, uh, well, yes, Mormonism is clearly a cult, but you should still believe in Jesus. And and clearly everything that you were doing was wrong. But these are all the things that you should be doing that are actually right. And I, I guess I would say to that, if you want to believe in Jesus, that's beautiful if that brings you comfort. But I'm on the side of that doesn't necessarily resonate with me to call myself Christian because I don't believe personally that there's a God in heaven on a throne judging me, wanting to send me to hell if I do something wrong. It just doesn't resonate with me. All of that to say, I believe the purpose of the channel is to amplify people's voices who have had less than ideal experiences in these groups that tend to be religions. And a lot of that is it's it's a negative experience. So see, some people will say, you're biased. You're only telling half the story. Yes, in a way I am, because I don't need to bring people on who are having warm and fuzzy experiences in their religion, because that's not the point. The point is to shed light on the uncomfortable, the dark, the dirty, the stuff that people don't normally talk about and aren't exposed to, because that's where the growth is. That's where you can show people this is where this group is being manipulative and this is how to avoid it. It's just about awareness. It's about drawing attention to these things. And like I said, shedding a light. Yeah. And I think for me, that's the most important thing. I think when the channel first started back in mid July of last year, this last year of last year, when I saw what this could be, which was which is really just a platform to platform people that need stories to be told um, and what that could do 
we basically have two viewers that two types of two viewers. types of viewers. We have the people that were in uh, who are having a, a post cult journey and need someone to relate to, need a companion as they further down they go further down the path. And then there are people like me that are just curious and interested in this cult world that didn't have a clue before of what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, but these people who are being vulnerable and are telling their stories, they're doing so much to help others. Yeah. And I think ultimately that's what we want to do with the channel is if we were to have a channel mission statement, it's to platform people to tell their stories and to be able to do that as much as possible. And to raise awareness, to ultimately to raise ultimately awareness. To raise because awareness. Because when you hear someone tell their story, usually, and this is what we see in the comments, is people say, I didn't grow up Mormon, but I grew up Jehovah's Witness, and I can so relate to this. Or I didn't even grow up religious, but I grew up in a culty household. I can so relate to this. And it allows people to have their own introspection about themselves, but also... If that person is ever to run into an ex-Mormon or even a current Mormon, it just allows them to understand them more as a human, what they're going through, what's going through their mind, why they act, think, and believe a certain way. And I think it can allow people to have more compassion and empathy for others. So it's actually the opposite of trying to bash religion. It's trying to help people understand people who are involved in these cults or who have left these cults and how to better interact with them. Yeah. So I feel like my job, I've kind of been like you alluded to earlier, I've been kind of the silent partner in all this. Um, little backstory, Shalice was uh, co-hosting another podcast called Mormons on Mushrooms. They essentially broke up with you. Two years in. Two years in after you helped facilitate its growth. You were a little down and out about it. And uh, this was early on in our relationship. So I was observing you and your level of involvement with the podcast and these uh, extracurricular, extracurricular festivals that they would do and how much you were kind of putting your heart and soul into it. And then to kind of just in an instant get broken up with. And um, a little bit about me. I came out here uh, to L.A. for film, went to film school. My background is in video production and my brother who were 14 years apart. So he is, he was at the time, so 2017 is when he decided to come out. I always had an open invitation for my brother throughout his adolescence to come and live with me. And um, at 19, he chose, he was having a rough time in college. He chose to come out. Little did I know that he had big YouTube dreams and I was directing music videos at the time and wanted to fully be a director, uh, writer, producer of stuff that you would see in movies, but Netflix, stuff like that. So as I'm observing him in his first weeks out here, this is back, so this is already like five, six years ago. Uh, he was 19 at the time. I always had my nose up to YouTube. It was very much like, this is not where a filmmaker goes. Little did I know, that's exactly where a filmmaker goes because you can cultivate your voice. You're creating content. So you're, you know, that's where you can have um, audience feedback. So as I'm seeing him in the YouTube world, immediately it was like, oh, I can help you with this. And then that turned into, yeah, we're going to partner up. My brother and I started a YouTube channel called Method Box, which is, um, has always kind of been brand building and finance based. I think what people loved about us, and I say that because we've already been in hiatus for over a year now. I wonder what happened this past year. I don't know. That we've been don't in hiatus. <laughs> no, also, I mean, we planned a wedding. I had the crazy wedding workload that was the post COVID wedding catch up. So at the time when we started our channel, Method Box, we were over producing our videos, but I think that's what people loved about us. You know, it was very like docu-narrative kind of style, always uh, commenting on the, on the production value and the editing and the storytelling. And for me, it was finally a chance to get to consistently be creative and express myself and be the director and all that. While going on this journey, cultivating a community we were, we became, my brother and I, students of YouTube. And there is uh, a way of understanding the grind that is because most people that decide to be content creators don't realize that you are now a performer, a writer, a producer, an editor, a cinematographer. And just when you think you're done and it's time to post the video, well, now you're Marketing a promoter. Team. Now you got to get that out. Now you got to get on TikTok and then rinse and repeat. That's that week. 
and then basically never stop. Every yeah. week, I always see the algorithm as this like fictitious beast that's just like more, more content, keep feeding <laughs> me, and it, it never ends. So most people sign up for something that they don't realize what it is, and then God forbid that you actually succeed to some capacity where you're like, well, now I have to keep going. Um, and by the way, there's usually no ROI as far as return on investment, return on investment, because um, like maybe you can, there's a select few that do turn it into a business. But for the most part, it's a labor of love. You have to just enjoy the kind of grind of it all. But you can do what we were doing, which is try to learn the algorithm, how to best make practices. best practices, how to make content that can have a, a bigger reach. So when uh, we find ourselves in this situation, where Mormons on Mushrooms breaks up with you and you're kind of down and out and you're questioning, kind of like you were saying with the dress, am I worthy enough to don Stand this dress? Babe, yes, you were the best part of that podcast, clearly, and I'm not <laughs> Thanks, biased. Babe. And I'm not biased. Um, <laughs> yeah, start your own podcast. But let's not go into the ether of the audio realm that is everyone starting a podcast. Let's take this to YouTube, yeah. have maximum reach, People need to see you. Let's bring the discussion there and let's do what we can to maximize our growth so that we can maximize our mission statement, yeah. which is how can we get the most amount of awareness about what's happening in these cults to the most amount of people. I've kind of been the silent partner that people may not realize behind the scenes. Co-producer. Yeah. Now we find ourselves in a studio, which my brother and I have always wanted a studio. And we finally buckled down and got our studio. And this is it. This is our first version of that. And we kind of always knew that Cults to Consciousness was going to be in the same studio because I don't know if you know this or if it was obvious or not, but we've filmed ev mostly every episode of a C2C in our bedroom. In our bedroom. In our bedroom. So cut to me kind of walking around our equipment because our camera just lives there. The big light bulb sphere lives there. Yeah. Um, the microphone lives there. Just uh, moving I mean, stuff how many every times are you like week. waking me up? Because, babe, I have to make the bed because I have, I have to, to film something in 15, in 15 minutes. minutes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let me get up. But also, yes, let's do it. For me, it's been such a, an amazing ride and getting to see you flourish. I think you're so great at conducting an interview, at cultivating a space that people can feel very open to tell their stories. Yeah. The last time we did this this type of video with me in it, this check-in video, I was raving about how the channel oh, just hit right. 1,000 subscribers. That was in October, uh -huh. three months in. Now we're 11 months in and just hit 60,000 subscribers. I am so curious to see what's gonna happen at the year mark, which will bring us back to mid-July in just two weeks. Who knows where we'll be a year from now because every time we have a new episode and it's time for you to conduct an interview. And I'm, and I'm so taken by even just your intro. People don't realize how hard it is to be in front of a camera. There's so much going on. Like you're, you're facilitating this interview and the cultivating the space. But at the same time, you have notes, you have a direction you want to go in. You have to be open yourself and empathetic to the guest. But at the same time, the video needs to have a cohesion to it. Your intro, your ability to suck someone in immediately, go in into the pertinent topics of what this video is going to be. Like I sit, as soon as you close the bedroom door, <laughs> I'm in the hallway sitting on my back on the carpet, the hallway rug. <laughs> and I like, I, I'm like a little giddy boy listening to you do your intro and Aww. um but we are scaling up yeah. so this is the new official studio i have to jump in because i have to give credit where credit is due which is you are the machine that i just <laughs> jump on and ride <laughs> because <laughs> there is so much that you do behind the scenes you are the thumbnail master yeah getting people to actually click on the video which is arguably the most important part because Titles. if people just scroll by it, then the yeah. stories go unheard. And we, like you said, we want maximum exposure. We want people to be able to feel heard and seen and and ultimately just Thank get you. their stories out. So I, he, he taught me how to edit. I didn't know what Premiere Pro even was. And it was like a new language. I'm sitting there trying to edit the first episodes and you know, every 10 minutes, babe, something happened. I don't know how to fix it. To where now I can edit an entire episode on my own. You help with the intros, like as far as the, the clips we put Thank at the you. very beginning. And yeah, you do so much. And because we wanted to ramp up, I started thinking, uh, here's a fun little channel announcement. We want to have a baby soon. We want to be parents. Yeah. So I started thinking, 
well, we're ramping up and we're starting to do three episodes a week because people are just devouring the content. They love yeah. the stories. And and now that we have people coming to us as offering their stories, it's a lot easier. Whereas before, we're like, oh my gosh, who are we going to get on? Trying to figure out stuff last minute. Up until like a month, a ago, month ago, it was like, yeah. Really hard. It was really hard to figure it out and and just sift through everything. And so we realized, okay, we are able to do more episodes and our ROI, return on investment, is really healthy right now. YouTube is rewarding us for- But also your Patreon. Thank yeah, you, patrons. Patreon. We one of the, One of the announcements is we were able to get the camera that we wanted. Yeah. So I don't know if you've- if you can pick up on it, but we have a big, beautiful camera with a beautiful lens that's going to be Shalise's camera now. Because we are ramping up and we want to put out more content and we want to have a family and make this our full time job. Guys, we're really trying to make this to where we can put all of our time and effort into building this community and into help tell people's stories. So I started thinking. If I'm the only host and something happens and I can't record a certain week because I'm pregnant or need to be with the baby, we should have on another host that can pop in and do their Who own could episodes. that possibly be? I'll give you a clue. He's very handsome and he's married to me. Oh, but also, um, so one of the things we want to start doing is engaging you guys more, hopping on that community page throwing up more polls. We've had two pretty successful polls of yeah. like, hey, would you want to see more of this and that? And we realized just how important it is to to do that. So um, there's going to be way more engagement on the community post. We want to play with bringing Jonathan on as a co-host for certain episodes, certain topics, because we also feel his perspective would be valuable in the sense that because I was raised in a cult, there are some things that I forget to explain uh, because it's just part of my psyche. So having him on as the the pragmatic uh, agnostic layman he calls himself yeah. who isn't really familiar with certain things he can ask those types of questions for our audience who relates more to him exactly because as we stated we have two types of audience those in the pol post cult experience and those that are just interested in it so i think i'm going to represent that also yeah. i'm not going to be in every episode also i don't want to necessarily affect too much of what the essence of this has been so far. Um, I definitely think that first and foremost, in any given episode that I'm in, the guest is at the forefront mm -hmm. in their story. You are doing the thing that you always do, which is navigate and guide that interaction. And then I might be just kind of a side character, side note, like, what about this though? Um, but that's all I kind of wanted to be. But yeah, maybe there will be times where I'm more involved or if take on a whole episode, I could take on a whole episode, which we'll see what that feels like later. I have to practice the intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last episode you did my intro wasn't completely there. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Giving you a hard time. Um, you know it. <laughs> I think I do know it at this point. But um, that's the big channel announcement. Yeah, I'm going to be a co-host and yeah. we'll see what that looks like. A co-host and, and maybe every now and then a guest host on his own. Also, because we've been getting so many people reaching out wanting to be guests, we decided it would be a good idea to redesign our website. So if you want to be a guest on Cults to Consciousness, you can go to our website, cultstoconsciousness.com, and we have an actual apply tab. So you can go on, tell us a bit about your story, and fill out an application so we can get a sense of who you are. You'll be able to submit a video of yourself so we can see your face and how you present your story and also just what you're working with as far as what it may look like if you were on the show. We will be looking through all the applications. So if you don't hear from us, there is a good chance that we could reach out later down the road when it feels like a right time to slide in your story. So there you go. There's that. Congratulations on 60,000 subscribers in 11 and a half months. And uh, the new studio, being able to just come in here and flip on all of the lights and Yeah, it's so much record. nicer. Don't have to make sure the bed is made perfectly yeah. and move the furniture around. And we actually have a bedroom back. Like he said, it was just crowded with gear before. And in fact, our neighbors came over for the first time, our new neighbors, and they walked into the bedroom and I was like, What's oh, by the way, here? we don't shoot porn in here. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, uh-huh. They're like, well, we're down for it. No, it's funny, but. Microphone and all. <laughs> yeah, microphone and all. Um, so another thing we wanted to run by you guys is we're toying with the idea of doing culty news every week, whether that's every day, every other day, every week. But 
in the sense of going live so I can actually interact with you guys and talk about what's going on in the cult sphere. And yeah. if you are interested in that, definitely let us know in the comments if that's something that you'd like. Boom. There it is. That's all we got. But it's a lot. <laughs> and I think it's a celebratory episode. I think people are interested to know like, yeah, well, what are you guys up to? And um, I'm happy to be on. We'll see. Feedback is always key. So yeah. when I am on, I guess, let me know how I do or what you'd like to see. Or I mean, or you're it... amazing, babe. You're intelligent. You're well-spoken. You're engaging. You're charismatic. You're Man, sexy. You're just filled with compliments. I love you so Thank much. Thank you. I love you so much. Everyone's like, gross, barf. Um, <laughs> but if you've made it this far, Thank you. Thank you. You're one of the real ones. And <laughs> let us know if you made it to the end, actually. We love seeing the same commenters pop back every video. It's like, hey, it's you, Jojo, it's you. You know, all the, the people that we yeah. recognize in the comments. So we do love interacting and we do our best to respond. But as he mentioned, there are a lot. So <laughs> Linda, listen. <gasps> Linda, listen. Life is not better when you are ignorant. Oh, he brought it around, guys. He brought it around. And with that, follow your highest excitement. <laughs> be conscious and be well. Wait, if you'd like to join our podcast. Oh, yeah, you, like you got to pump them. If you'd like to support the podcast, we would super appreciate it if you would go to patreon.com slash cults to consciousness and uh, interact with us there. We do more behind the scenes stuff. And if what I always tell you, if you like this video, <laughs> yeah. you're going to want to watch this video that we're gonna put on now. Thank you so much. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. <laughs> that was good.